Hello, everybody. How are you? We're talking about Catherine McBanawa today and what she knew and why isn't she talking about what she knows. And before we get into that, let's have a little blast from the past, shall we? It doesn't look like Phil Am murder suspect Catherine McBanwa can spend Christmas with her family. A judge has denied her request for bail while awaiting her first trial on February 27. McBanwa is accused of serving as a conduit between two alleged hitmen and whoever ordered the killing of Florida professor Dan Markell on July 2014, a plot that authorities say was sparked by a bitter divorce and family conflict. She's been charged with first-degree murder, but she maintains her innocence. And the state has made it absolutely clear what their intention is and why they are fighting so hard to keep her in custody. Because they are trying to, they're trying to break her. But Katie has maintained her innocence from day one. So what the state wants her to do is basically lie to them. That's what they want. They're not trying to get her to cooperate. They're trying to get her to lie. They want her to lie. She's cooperating with the law right now. She's not committing perjury but they're trying to force her. That is not constitutional. That is not right. Markel was shot to death in his garage more than two years ago. The alleged hitmen, Sigredo Garcia and Luis Rivera, were arrested this year. Garcia has two children with a 31-year-old Magbanwa. It was Rivera that implicated Magbanwa, and he got a reduced sentence in return. Magbanwa's lawyers argue that Rivera is a convicted felon who cannot keep his story straight. Isn't it amazing how much younger all these lawyers look? It's incredible. <laughs> Single thing that Luis Rivera has said or done has not been impeached by other pieces of evidence or other witnesses. In this case, justice took a backseat to ego and politics a long time ago. With that evidence that we saw in there today, Detective Isom himself said, I do not trust Luis Rivera. I acknowledge his inconsistencies. They, they're they there. Um, but the majority of what he has to say fits with all the other evidence in the case, and that's what's compelling about his testimony. So how is Magbanwa connected to Markel, the victim? The prosecution points out that the Pinay used to have a romantic relationship with Markel's ex-brother-in-law, Charles Adelson. Markel and Charles's sister, Wendy, divorced in 2013. Do you notice that they're calling him Char... Charles Adelson, and then on the chart, it says Charlie. It's just funny to me. Teen. But before it was finalized, the two fought over Wendy's plan to move her two children from Tallahassee to South Florida to be closer to her family. Following Markel's death, McBano was reportedly paid more than $10,000 by the Adelson family. Despite this, authorities say there is not enough evidence to charge any member of the Adelson family. They have also denied their involvement in the crime. During her bail hearing, Magbanwa's brother Eric says his sister will not flee. He cited that his sister moved to Florida when she was seven years old from the Philippines and had not even been back there since. In this case, the judge did not agree. Magbanwa is not expected to cut a deal with prosecutors between now and her trial in February. Her lawyers insist she will prove her innocence. And that was a very bad choice by Katie McBanoa. They offered her a deal. She said no. All this we're going to get into and more. So much good stuff today. Cannot wait to talk about it. Be back right after this. You are listening to the Roberta Glass True Crime Report, putting the true back in true crime. From New York City, Roberta Glass is now on the record. Okay. So what I really wanted to talk about is why Katie McManawa hasn't talked, 
hasn't spilled more than she has? How did she pay for her lawyers? All these issues came up back in 2017, and we are going to go through it, look at her cross-examination, and maybe talk maybe a little bit about if she might be a little more loose-lipped now that she is represented by court-appointed lawyers. All this is just interesting to think about. Of course, her pro offers were a big meh, at least as far as I'm concerned, were a little disappointing. Her testimony was very strong in Charlie Adelson's trial when everyone was saying, don't get her up on the stand. She's a liar. She lied in two trials because, of course, her first trial she got a hung jury, and then the second one she got convicted and then got life. So she's doing life without the possibility of parole. It's up to the state to determine how they might renegotiate her sentence. We still haven't heard much about that. Tomorrow, Donna has a hearing. I am, of course, off. I may be live streaming it. Don't really know right now, but check my channel. I may be doing a surprise live stream with that. I expect it to be pretty quick if it's what I think it is. But I've been wrong so many times about these hearings as far as what's interesting and what is not or what what I predict is going to be interesting or explosive. So we all notice that Katie has three private lawyers. And I was really curious as to why the state never really pushed on this and said, this might be a conflict of interest. And of course, in the Nexium trial, which is a trial I covered, and that's, of course, a federal trial, we had all these defendants all being paid for by Claire Bronfman, and it took forever in the, what's called the cur- Curcio hearings to work that out because it was considered a conflict of interest for the defendant. Why didn't the state push more was what I was asking as to how both sick Sigfredo Garcia and Katie were getting paid. Then Murder by Maestro showed me this document. And I want to show it to you. So this is a motion for conflict of interest inquiry. And I'm sorry about the line down the middle, but it gets pretty interesting around page three. So it says, Since the homicide, McBanawa has been receiving compensation from the Adelson Institute for Aesthetic and Implant Dentistry. That always just makes me laugh which is Charlie Adelson's family dental practice, although her cell data indicates she was never physically present at the dental office, excuse me, she consistently received checks from the business signed by Donna Adelson, totaling more than $10,500. McBanawa's financial records also show numerous cash deposits over the time since the homicide, ranging in amounts from $300 to $2,000 for each deposit, with some deposits being made on the same date. Between the time of the homicide and November of 2015, McBanawa deposited more than $56,000 in cash into her bank accounts. So all this was brought up at her trial. 
Additionally, Magbanawa's bank accounts reveal a significant increase in cash deposits after the homicide in July 2014. In the 12 months leading up to the homicide, McBanawa made cash deposits, which totaled approximately $17,000, with approximately $10,000 of that total deposit in the four months immediately preceding the homicide. So it goes on, and then it goes to describe Sigfredo Garcia's financial situation. At the time of Garcia's arrest on May 25th, 2016, he was employed and received direct deposits from Rapid Funding Capital. The last deposit from that business occurred on June 10th, 2016, in the amount of $44.67. His bank account had $1,000. 2321 as of July 19, 2016. Without gainful employment, he has no known source of income in which to pay for his or McBanawa's legal fees. Catherine McBanawa's bank account shows small deposits from the Adelson Institute up until February 2016, and unidentified sources of cash deposits through November 2015 for up to for the year 2015, excuse me. These combined sources of income come to $35,799.30. The undersigned is still pursuing sufficient bank records to determine her 2016 income. I'm sure she was still still pursuing them. However, since her arrest in October, uh, since her arrest in October 2016, she would not have had any source of gainful employment in which to pay for her legal fees. The state is not aware of any other property, accounts, or other assets that these defendants could be using to finance their defense. Despite having no apparent ability to pay for private attorneys, Defendant McBanawa has hired two private criminal defense attorneys. I said three because there was like three at the... There's always three at the table that may be an assistant uh, on our first trial from South Florida. And defendant Garcia has obtained private counsel from the South Florida area. These private attorneys have traveled up from South Florida during the pendency of the case. So it goes on to say that they stayed. They've been making trips. They're talking about all the fees that would come with having these attorneys attorneys and they're saying like, look, they're making the case that they don't have it. And it was signed by Georgia Kappelman. You can almost hear her speaking in this. So at the end, it says, wherefore the undersigned assistant state's attorney requests that this honorable court hold an inquiry into the source of the defendant's fund for representation, determine whether or not a conflict of interest exists, and determine whether or not the defendant can effectively waive such a conflict. So pretty interesting. Thank you, Murder from Maestro, for bringing this to my attention. And then... As I was discussing this with a listener who's a lawyer, Matt Schneider, he sent me this, got a lot of help on this episode. So the date is, I believe, 7-21-2017. So this was an in-camera meeting, and that means the judge and the lawyers met for Sigfredo Garcia and Katie McBanawa and met with the judge and the judge was sufficiently 
satisfied that a third party is paying for attorney not related to the Adelson family. And in my opinion, I can't think who that would be if it's not the Adelson family paying, giving it to someone else. And I was asking Matt, like, could they do some kind of, would they do, is a better way to put it, would they do some kind of Watergate type investigation, follow the money investigation into this? And he's like, probably not. They probably came in and said, this is how we're getting it and showed maybe a bank record or something. And I think, in my opinion, that they may have bamboozled the judge. Because unless I don't know, you know, I can't know what I don't know unless the Mag, <laughs> Mag Banawa and Garcia have some kind of patron that I don't know about. Pretty interesting. That would pay two of Katie's trials all the way up to when she got convicted. And then it's gone. Public defender. So I wanted to look at her cross-examination, which is I thought quite fiery and interesting today. Oh, thank you, MW, for the super sticker. I appreciate it. And But before I do, I'm going to take a quick break, rest my voice, and I'll be back in right after this. Don't go anywhere. If you are enjoying this episode of My True Crime Report, please hit the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and share this episode. Get access to exclusive podcasts and other bonus content by becoming a patron today. If you have a question or comment for me, shoot me a super chat and I'll do my best to answer it and read it on air. Thanks so much. Now back to the show. Okay, so, oh, actually, I wanted to show you this, actually, before I do, before I get into her, I knew there was one other part of I planned. There's a really interesting part before Katie testifies, before we get into her cross. I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm so excited to show you <laughs> everything I've prepared. I'm getting it way ahead of myself. So watch this interesting part. Right before Katie testifies, it looks like they told her that she has to testify right then. And I know that her lawyer says we met the night before, but she looks terrified. And watch Dacost. Dacost pushes himself away, starts looking at Georgia, and is not at all, looks not at all happy by my eye. And by Murder for Maestro's Eye, he's the one who brought this to my attention. We were talking about this together. They look really unhappy. He's, but this is an, a catch definitely by Murder for by Maestro. Let's check it out. No, you are. Um, what, what's the defense plan that the other side is what you're doing? We're going to need to figure that out before the jury comes in because this changes. Maybe because your client decided whether she's testifying or not. One second, Jordan. Yes. I met with Ms. Montgomery last night and spoke with her, and she is going to be testifying this morning. She what? She will be testifying. Okay. Look at how unhappy Katie looks. She's looking around and then look at, watch, keep your eye on DeCoste. And Kawas is just like, move forward. This is her idea. She's told Katie she definitely has to testify. Let 
let's um, talk about a plan on scheduling. What um, is the state thinking you'll have rebuttal? Yes, sir. So far, we know one rebuttal witness. Right. Make sure you have them available. I don't want to delay. Yes, uh, sir. So they're, while they're going through it, it's unreal. So just watch all this back and forth while they go through it. I have also read that Sigfredo Garcia was unhappy with this, but it's hard to read his face behind the Law and Crime logo. Thanks, Law and Crime. And probably my logo, too, now. But you can see his lawyer looks totally unprepared for this decision, too. It looks like they had one strategy and they changed radical course. Deal with it when it comes. Uh, you certainly be heard at the appropriate time. Um, but let's talk about scheduling. Uh, how would y'all propose we proceed from here? Uh, I assume we're going to finish the testimony. Uh, so, my apologies for the sound. It's really not so much about the sound. Just watch the body language as this is discussed, watch to cost. Watch the sort of chaos on, on both defense legal teams. And Dacos keeps looking over at Georgia and moving further and further away from his uh, legal team. Maybe early afternoon today. Um, how would y'all propose we proceed? My proposal would be as soon as this afternoon, let the jury go home. Just by the body language, it just seems like um, 
I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name, Kawas and and McBanoa are just totally a team. And Dacost is like, this is a really bad idea. And it was a really bad idea in the first trial. And it's a was a really bad idea in the second trial. Insist on the jury being sequestered overnight if they don't get reach a verdict tomorrow. All right. I just wanted you to see her frozen, absolutely frozen demeanor. And it looked like they were just doing it on the fly. Unreal. So let's get into her uh, testimony. Shall we? Her, actually, her cross, which is really more, much more explosive than her... Her direct is so, frankly, kind of boring and hard to believe, and she's not a good liar, but you'll see this on, on Cross. All right, come the water course back in session. So I'm getting word that Donna's hearing is canceled for, or, or moved for tomorrow. That's not unusual for a hearing to be moved. Wouldn't it be wild if Donna was making, trying to make some sort of plea, <laughs> plea deal with the state? That would be wild. You think that she would, I can't imagine she's so arrogant ever giving up her daughter. I really believe that Charlie and Donna and Wendy, should she ever be, charged for this will go to their grave saying they didn't do it. All rise for the jury. Ms. McDonough, you testified about Mr. Rivera's uh, reputation in the community for violence. Are you aware of Mr. Garcia's reputation in the community for violence? Yeah, yeah, overruled. As far as, I mean, he's probably. a violent guy too, right? In the past. Sustained. Does he also have a reputation in the community for violence? When he was younger, yes, he used to get in trouble. But he wouldn't do anything for Charlie Adelson, right? No. Because he hated Charlie. Adelson. He hated him. But he would do anything for you, wouldn't he? No, because sometimes I ask him simple tasks and he can't even do that. He loved you, didn't he? I believe so. He was desperate to get you back. We've heard a lot of evidence about that, haven't we? Yes, ma'am. What about for $100,000? Would he do things for that? No, ma'am. No. No. Okay. Have you seen the deep sea fishing thread states 183? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And did you already testify on cross with Mr. Sangane that watch your head, please. That you, after reviewing this text, do not believe that Mr. Garcia was actually inviting Mr. Adelson to go deep sea fishing. You mean Charlie inviting Oh, Mr. Garcia inviting him? No, I believe not. So that was a joke? I, I would took it as a joke. I mean, from reading it. So very much like the answer that Charlie Adelson gave at his trial, that the birthday card and the gift, which was pot, <laughs> was just sarcastic and that he he blew it out of the park, something like that hit it out of the park, something like that, with that gift. It was like, oh, that was sarcastic. Same answer here. And it will get more ridiculous as this cross goes on. The same sort of issues I brought up in the beginning of this episode, which is how is Katie paying for all this stuff? Oh, yeah, I paid for my teeth whitening, my breast job. I don't even know if she really claims that. She's, I believe it. She gives a little bit. She's a little bit more vague on that. And then it gets to Charlie Adelson's limo. Apparently he owned a limo 
And she was like, oh, I paid the driver for that day. Totally. With what? With what, Katie? And of course, on her direct, she's like making up all these things that she's getting tips and all this different cash from different places and putting it, squirreling it into the bank in small amounts. It, it, I can't believe she hung a jury, but she did. All right. Being sarcastic. <clears throat> Yes, ma'am. All right. So was it a joke or not? To me, yes, it was a joke. Okay. So you were worried about Mr. Garcia contacting Mr. Adelson. Yes, ma'am. But you don't have any knowledge whether he did or that he actually did. Um, no. Okay. Why are your lawyers trying to suggest that Mr. Garcia contacted Mr. Adelson? Why are they trying to suggest that he contacted him? Yeah. I don't know. Did Mr. Garcia even know that Charlie Adelson was the one paying for this murder? Let's repeat that question again. Did Mr. Garcia even know that Mr. Adelson was the one behind this whole thing? Well, what time? Ever. I believe not. Okay. Because you didn't tell him who it was, did you? I didn't know who it was. You told him it was Wendy, didn't you? No. You watched the testimony of Luis Rivera, didn't you? Yes. And you testified that he is a gang member, yes? Yes, ma'am. That he is a violent person, correct? Yes, ma'am. Member of the Latin Kings and a crown or head of that organization, right? Yes, ma'am. You testified that you know he has a tattoo, um, a large tattoo on his stomach, and that you know about how many phones he has. Remember that? Well, he said that he had two phones. Okay. And that you know about some of his- Excuse me, Ms. Kappelman? His stomach tattoo is legendary. I mean, sure, I didn't know him well, but everybody knew about that stomach tattoo. Am I right? <laughs> so I would say she's a really poor liar. I would give her about a three from a one to a 10. What would, I'm curious what you think. His criminal activities, you testified about certain things he engages in. With Rivera, you're talking about? Yeah. Him. Yes. Yeah. All right, but you also said you don't know him very well. When did I say that? On direct examination. I mean, I know of him. I mean, he's he's been around us before. When did I say that? Um, About two minutes ago, Katie? You just said that about two minutes ago on direct? <laughs> terrible. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, terrible, terrible testimony. Before, like he's... Yeah, I mean, he's the best friend of your child's father, correct? I would guess so. They've known each other since childhood. Since they were young, yes. So you've known Mr. Rivera as long as you've known Mr. Garcia? No. When did you meet Mr. Rivera? Uh, years later. Okay. Did you hear Mr. Rivera get asked about his opportunities to review the evidence in this case? Yes, ma'am. And you've had those same opportunities, haven't you? Yes, ma'am. How much time have you spent reviewing the evidence in this case? Well, just probably the last month or two because we didn't have a lot of the evidence. Okay, so before that you weren't aware of any of the facts of the case? I was aware of some of the facts of the case. And it's your testimony that, did your lawyers tell you they didn't have anything until last month? No, we only had a couple of the things, like there's certain things that you guys just showed us okay. during this trial right now. How much time have you spent reviewing the evidence in this case? How much time? Not yeah. a lot. How much? I can't give you a certain time. A couple hours? Maybe. Okay. And you can read, can't you? Ms. Yes, ma'am. You're an educated person, aren't you? Yes, ma'am. College graduate? Yes, ma'am. All right. How far did Mr. Garcia get in school? Uh, he has his GED, but he has certifications as well. All right. Certifications in? Um, Masonry. Okay. Heavy equipment. Heavy, Heavy equipment, equipment operation. Mm -hmm. All right. And did you have a lot of control over Mr. Garcia? I mean, were you the one that wore the pants in that relationship when y'all were together? I mean, he listened to certain things, but there's a lot of things that he just wouldn't listen to as well. Okay. And when he was working, his paychecks went directly into your account. Is that right? In what job? Uh, whenever he was working. Did that, you tell me? Yeah, he'd give me a portion of his paycheck. A portion or the whole thing? Sometimes a portion, sometimes the whole thing. It depends. It's not a set amount. 
Okay. At the time frame that we looked at for purposes of this investigation, his whole paycheck was going into your account. Would you agree with that? Objection does uh, overrule. Would you agree with that? His whole paycheck <clears throat> when he was working in Rapid Capital? Yes. I don't believe he was giving me his whole paycheck. Okay. In the time frame leading up to the homicide that we're here about, yes, uh, Mr. Garcia was living with this exotic dancer who was but known by the name of Shrimp, right? Yes, and he was not steadily employed at that time, correct? Mm -hmm. And in fact, he had no vehicle at that time. Wow, wait, the exotic dancer's name was Shrimp? <laughs> If I, if I wasn't, didn't have the, the closed caption up, I wouldn't believe what I just heard. Shrimp? What kind of, what kind of name is that? I believe he did have a vehicle. Okay, what vehicle did he have? I don't know because he's always changing up his cars. Okay. And rarely had any money during that time frame. Would you agree with that? When he was living with her? Yes, ma'am. I don't know if he had a steady income on something, but he did and have he money. Was, he was living off of her. Would you agree with that? Or you no. don't know? You I, don't I agree with I that? wouldn't know. He took off work to come to Tallahassee in June of 2014, and that was at the Coastal Masonry. Um, did you know about that, that he had taken off work during those days? I didn't even know he was working at that time. And you didn't take him to the rental car place? No, ma'am. Why do, do your phone records put you there, that time frame? It was around other businesses. I don't, I don't recall what I did that day. You don't recall what you did that day, but you know you didn't go to that rental car place, right? Yeah, no. That you do remember. Yes, ma'am. If you had fled to the Philippines as your attorney suggested. The rental car place, and if you've watched the episode where showed you Murder by Maestro's video where the car rental place, he had a relationship with Sigfredo Garcia. And he said, my brother's going to pick it up, meaning Rivera. And it was written on the slip brother. So it was a friendly rental car place. So Murder by Maestro was making the argument. And boy, is, are his ears burning probably right now with all this... <laughs> all this mentioning of his channel name is that they had to set up Jeffrey Lacoste by getting a car that looked similar. And he made the argument that, and Jibbers has made the argument using Jibbers channels work that all the cars look very similar to Jeffrey Lacoste's car. They're all similar size, similar shade that was chosen to do this job because as you know, they came up before and because Dan Markell was with his children, Rivera said they couldn't do it then. So they had to make another trip. Arrested you could have, you could have still been arrested for this murder, correct? I believe so. Yeah, and your fleeing could have been used against you as consciousness of guilt, right? But why would I leave? I don't know. That's my point, you wouldn't. Did, uh, you I admitted didn't. you lied on your tax returns, right? Yes, ma'am. And you admitted you lied to the Department of Children and Families, yes? Yes, ma'am. And do you know what the statute of limitations is on those crimes? No, ma'am. Your attorney didn't advise you that it would be okay to admit those crimes because the statute of limitations had run? It was the truth, ma'am. She was asking me a question. Okay. So you don't know about that? No, ma'am. As far as you know, you could be charged with that. So as an attachment to what I showed you with the state filing asking about her finances, because when you ask for bail, you have to put together all your finances. She basically says that she owns, let me take a look at it. She has something like eight, I mean, $2,975 or 2,000. I mean, just like in the thousands of dollars, nothing that would pay for a lawyer. So Again, it's a massive problem. Where is all this money coming from for these lawyers? And in this case, where is all the money coming from that she got after this, after Dan Markell's murder? Yes, ma'am. All right. 
So you've admitted that you had a sexual relationship with both Sigfredo Garcia and Charlie Adelson around the same time frame. Yes, ma'am. And they knew about each other, according to your direct examination. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Meaning they knew each other existed or they knew, actually knew that you were sleeping with both of them at the same time? No, they knew each other existed. Okay. Yes. So they didn't know that you were, each one didn't know you were sleeping with the other one? No, ma'am. All right. So you were lying to them about that. I mean, I didn't think that I had to tell either one that I was sleeping with the other. Okay. And that's also known as lying. Would you agree? No, I, I don't agree with that. Okay. Um, you understand that today you're sworn to tell the whole truth. Yes, ma'am. All right. And you also lied to Charlie Adelson about, uh, I think, certain things that were happening around the time of that bump and that wire. Yes, ma'am. All right. You lied to him when you told him that you had called the number on the paper, right? Yes, ma'am. And you were actually trying to get Mr. Garcia to call that number, right? Yes, ma'am. And did you tell Mr. Garcia that you were trying to get him to call a number for Mr. Adelson? No, ma'am. All right. And you testified on direct that the reason you went to Mr. Garcia for assistance is not because he had something to do with this murder, but because he's your child's father and that's who you go to when you have a problem, right? Well, at that specific time, yes. All right. And that's why you solicited him to commit this murder, right? No, ma'am. And he's the person you go to when you have a problem. Thank you. You would insinuate that, yes, but that's your opinion. No, that's I'm not what you, happened. Is that a person you go to when you have a problem? Yes, ma'am. Isn't the turnaround amazing? Isn't she like a different person in Charlie Adelson's trial? This is Katie the Defiant. Katie the fighter, feisty Katie. And it's, I think pretty unbecoming on the stand. You want to have the attitude of really being relaxed and, and just stating your truth and kind of letting the, you know, punches roll. But this is not the way Katie's going. Katie's going to go down fighting with Georgia Kappelman. And boy, is it not a good look. What I heard from Ruth Markell is that there was like one juror in this case who hung on Katie, and that's what hung the whole trial. And what a what an expensive uh, what an expensive juror that was for for all parties, both the taxpayers paying for it and the whoever was paying for Katie's defense. You didn't ask Mr. Garcia to help this lady get her kids back in Tallahassee. No, ma'am. You didn't solicit him to commit a murder of Dan Markell? No, ma'am. Do you know who Tuto is? Yes, ma'am. Who is Tuto? Sigfredo Garcia. And who is Tato? Luis Rivera. And when Charlie Adelson told you that the person that approached his mother said these names, you didn't tell him that you knew exactly who those people were, did you? I didn't tell whom? Charlie Adelson. <laughs> That I didn't tell him who Tudo was. He didn't mention Tudo's name until later on. He mentioned Tudo's name on his wire calls, didn't he? Yeah, on the phone calls. And he mentioned Tato's name on the wire calls. But that was later on. Okay. Whenever it was. Yeah. He mentioned those names to you. And you didn't say, oh, I know exactly who that is. That's my baby daddy and his best friend. But he knows Tudo's name. So okay. Why, well, he didn't act like he knew it on the wire, did he? Yes. He did act like no, he, he didn't. Him? He oh. acted like that's why it was kind of weird when he kept saying like Taco or whatever. He yeah. knows Tuzo's name. But did he know Tato's name? No. Okay. So he'd never met Tato to no. your knowledge. All right. He was actually just, they were talking, they were planning out that birthday party dinner, right? It was paella and tacos and shrimp. Maybe, <laughs> maybe that's, maybe that's where all these where it all comes in. Maybe I'm making a better defense for her. She's a terrible, I think a terrible liar. All right. And so he knew Tuto's name. Why didn't you say Tuto? You know who Tuto is. Tuto is my baby daddy. I just didn't say, I just, I told, I just told you that it sounded weird that he's saying a different name when he knows Tuto's name. Yeah. It sounded mm -hmm. weird. So my question is, why didn't you say, what are you talking about? You know who Tuto is. Objection, I Dr. didn't ask. Answer overruled. What's your answer? Man? I just didn't ask. Okay, because you don't ask questions. I mean, haven't we pretty much established that? 
You yes. didn't ask any questions when this bump went down about what's going on. Why am I getting involved in this? Why would I help you try to figure out who this is that's extorting I, your mother? Okay, I, I did ask. Question, though, just one question. When Charlie Adelson told you that his mother had said your name. Yes, ma'am. Okay. When was that? When did he tell you? See the time frame. I'm getting confused because I don't, I don't know if it was in a phone call or when he met with me in Dolce Vida. Okay. So, because he was saying ex girlfriend before, and then all of a sudden he's saying my name. Yeah. So at first he just knew ex girlfriend. He didn't know for sure it was you. Yes, ma'am. But you're the one he called, right? Yes, ma'am. He has a lot of ex girlfriends, as y'all discussed on the calls. Yes, ma'am. Do you know why it is that he chose you out of all the 87 ex girlfriends to call? So I'm really surprised that she's admitting that she was on the Dolce Vita tapes. I thought she was going to be like, I'm sorry, no. What you saw was a hologram. What? No. <laughs> what you saw? It was a hologram and a AI, maybe AI didn't really, wasn't so big back then, but surprised she didn't make some. It was a woman who sounded like me. Veronica Sawyer, thanks so much for the super chat. Shrimp scampi fund. Yeah, definitely. It's from the shrimp scampi fund. Terrible, terrible, terrible liar. Am I wrong? He's just exaggerating about the 87 girlfriends. I don't I don't know why he called me. All right. Well, how many ex girlfriends I was the, does he have? I was the only last ex girlfriend like he was dating to his knowledge. But they didn't say last ex girlfriend. No, but I'm saying he said ex girlfriend. I was his last ex girlfriend. Okay. Why did you help Charlie investigate who this person was that approached his mother? I can't tell you why, like I did. I mean, he's asked me weird stuff before, but somebody mentioned my name and that's what piqued my interest. I was like, why would, why would somebody approach your mother saying my name? And then I didn't know about Tuto's name until later on. But even before that, you were willing to help him with this problem, right? Yes, ma'am. Is it your testimony to this jury that you don't recall any of the conversation that occurred between you and Charlie Adelson at Dolce Vita? Not that I didn't remember. I just, there's, I know he was saying different scenarios. Somebody bumped into his mom and he was saying different, different scenarios. But like I said, he got scenarios. This is where we get into the scenario territory. And once she sort of starts saying scenarios, Scenarios is now her new favorite word, as I remember this testimony, and through her whole defense, it's scenarios. He was talking scenarios. He was just talking scenarios. It's so weak. And you can see the difference between Charlie Adelson, who really planned out his testimony and was every minute in jail thinking about the evidence and knew every piece of evidence and was aware of every piece of evidence. And Katie who got put on the stand or looked like, that's what it looked like to my eye, got put on the stand last minute. He was very nervous, whether it was the night before or the day of. She was not prepared for this. They had not prepared her. And that's also a problem when you have, have lawyers, have, I don't know, you know, I, I just think it was a poor decision, but they felt maybe they felt like they got a win when they got a hung jury and emboldened by it. And they were going to do it again, try it again a second time around. And it, it went worse the second time around. That it could be cops or it could be somebody harassing his family for money or extorting his family for money. And but why would it be the cops? I don't know, because he's always talking about the cops. Okay, but you didn't ask him why the cops would be running an undercover operation on his mother? No, ma'am. And you don't remember him reading to you a phone number from a piece of paper? 
No, ma'am. He didn't show me a paper. He might have given me a number, like giving me a number, but he didn't show me any paper. Okay. But you've seen the video, correct? Of the Dolce Vida? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And he pulled out a piece of paper clearly on that video, right? No, ma'am. He did not. He did not show me any paper. All right. Is that you and Charlie on the video? I know you can only see your legs, but is that you? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And that's Charlie Adelson? Yes, ma'am. All right. So he told you different scenarios. It could be the cops or it could. And she comes off really as a sullen teenager in this. You know when a teenager is caught in a lie and they'll just argue and get really, really bratty? That's how she comes across, really bratty. And, and it's a technique to make Georgia Kappelman step off. And you can hear that when she's telling Charlie to call the number himself. She's yelling at him and she's dropping F-bombs left and right. She really thought that this would make Georgia Kappelman back off, but it's a different scenario. Excuse me, let me use her word. Different scenario than when in real life than when you're on the stand. It, her aggression may make other people back off in real life, but on the stand, it's just, it's not going to work. And it's a terrible look for her. Could be, what else? Somebody extorting money from his family. Okay. And why would somebody be extorting money from his family? I don't know. He's had dealings with other people before. like. Mm -hmm. But to extort, you have to have some leverage on the person, right? You have to have something on them. I guess. And what was the thing that this person might have on Mr. Adelson? He didn't. I mean, he might have said something, but like I said, he just goes on and on about stuff. And he told you to find out who this was that contacted his mother. Yes, ma'am. And do you recall him telling you that this person, if it's not the cops, may need to be killed? No, ma'am. Do you remember that he said? No, ma'am. Now she's warming up. No, ma'am. When it comes to the subject of murder, she's warming up. She's trying to <laughs> warm herself up because she must know that this isn't... This is, this is uh, not a good look. And I'm sure her lawyers told her not to get feisty on the stand, but she can't help herself. MW, thank you so much. For, uh, thank you, Roberta, for all that you do. That's very kind of you to say. You're welcome. Let's get back into this. And thank you very much. Said Well, let me ask it this way. You talked about on direct that you just kind of tuned him out during this conversation. Is that accurate? Certain conversations, yes, ma'am. Okay, but you can tell the jury that he definitely did not say that the person may need to be killed. Yes, because I'd remember something like that. Oh, you would have tuned back in for that? I would just remember him saying, like, why would you say something like that? What else can you tell the jury specifically about that conversation? I don't remember much about that conversation. Like I said, okay, that well, was years ago. You don't remember much? That's still good enough for us. Tell us what you do remember. That he was saying the same thing, that he thought, you know, like it could be the cops or somebody extorting money from his family. That's it? That's all I can recall. Did he tell you the phone number of the person that he I, wanted you to call? I don't know if he told me the phone number there or at a, a later time. Okay, but at some point remember. you got that phone number. Yes, ma'am. All right. Do you remember Charlie Adelson at that Dolce meeting telling you that you should call the number and tell the person that he is or you are willing to help out the person, but it was a one-time deal and it was just for charity. Objection here, say that's not an evidence. Overruled. Did that occur? I only remember that because a portion of the tape where you had some transcript and I might've read that part, but I don't remember that from that day. Okay. 
And so if he was... You might have had some piece of evidence. It might have been written down directly, transcribed, <laughs> and, and shown to me one time. She says it with such disgust, like it's nothing. But I don't remember it. Okay, okay, okay. So teenagerish, right? Okay, okay, mom. I'm just talking. He was just talking scenarios. Did you not hear me say scenarios? It, is that not the get out of jail freak word? Scenarios? You just get up here and say scenarios. He was talking scenarios and it's over. I was going to keep this person quiet through the guise of an act of charity. That would be kind of similar to how he kept you quiet, right? No, ma'am. I mean, he gave you a lot of gifts, didn't he? Which gifts? Um, well, he gave... We're talking about your breasts, Katie. Actually, we're just talking about one breast. We're not sure which one, the left or the right. I just find that so amusing that Charlie Adelson only paid for half a breast augmentation. So is it the left? Is it the right? Is there a way to tell? And somehow she came up with the other half. Gave you a paid for trip to Santo Domingo for you and Mr. Garcia. Is that true? No, that's actually for my children and I visiting his parents, his mom, my mother-in-law. Did Charlie pay for it? Yes, ma'am. Um, did he call in prescriptions for you, Mr. Adelson? Did he call in prescriptions for yes, me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, he has before. Did he let you drive his Ferrari? No. Did he pay for your Mazda repair? Not that I can recall. I'm pretty sure I pay for my Mazda repairs. Okay. Did he pay for your insurance? For, for what? Insurance. I didn't have insurance through him. So no to insurance, no to Mazda repair, and no to Ferrari? Yeah, no, I never drove his Ferrari. Okay. Did he pay for a meal service for you? Yes, I remember that. Did he pay your credit card bill one time when you couldn't make your credit card bill? Not that I can recall. Did he ever give you cash? Not that I can recall. On May 20th, 2015, do you recall sending a text to Mr. Adelson asking him for money? I don't remember that. Okay, and do you remember Mr. Adelson giving you $1,400 six days later? I don't remember that. Is that something you would remember? Yes, if he gave me that amount of money. But your testimony is you don't have any recollection of him ever giving you any cash. Yeah, I don't remember that. And you never saw any cash in his place when you were over there? No, I don't remember that. Did he pay for a cruise for you and your mom? No. Did he pay for breast augmentation for you? No. Did he pay for teeth whitening for you or your family? No, I pay for my teeth whitening. <laughs> Did he offer to let you use his boat? He's offered, yes, but I never took it. What about his limousines? I paid for the limousine service. Okay. He, ha he owns a limo, right? I don't think, I didn't know if he owned the limo. I just, I paid the driver to, for like hourly. Okay. You tip the driver or you paid hourly for the service? Hourly for the service. So Georgia Kappelman is expertly painting a picture of a woman living high off the hog. Breast augmentation, credit cards being paid for, cruises or trips right? What cash given when needed? Have we ever seen this kind of generosity with anyone else? With Charlie Adelson? And now the limo. She's running around Miami in limos. They weren't exactly on the down low here, living on the down low. They were flaunting it. Stu stupid, right? And would any of those things have come out of your account? Your Either of your bank accounts? I mean, I had the cash for it. So you paid for all the things that we just talked about in cash? I don't remember. I don't recall if I made some with my credit card, made some with my, um, paid some with cash. 
what about the Mazda repair? Do you recall whether you paid for that with cash or credit card? I think I paid with a credit card. Okay. I'm not 100% sure. And how much cash did you typically have on hand? It depends, like whatever amount that I make in the club and like I start saving up, then I put it away. So I can have between two, $3,000 on me. When you say put it away, what do you mean? Like put it in my bank. Okay. Like I'll save it up in my house and then I'll put it away when I get a chance to go to the bank. Okay. But all these things that you have paid for. You know what she is? She's a stop and start liar. So when she's lying, it's very jerky, her language, because she's still thinking about what she's saying. So listen to the rhythm when she's telling the truth and when she's, which is not often, most of it's going to be pretty stop and start, very jerky. And other people pointed out in her direct when she was asked, did she have anything to do with the murder of Dan Markell? She said no while nodding her head yes. And check out, I just put up a short of Amanda Knox doing similar thing. Your body is used to being congruent with your language. So your body knows the truth. Not always, this doesn't always happen with everybody, but occasionally the truth leaks out through your body language. Or like, let's just take the breast augmentation, for example. You yes, indicate you paid for that. Yes, ma'am. But there, if you're putting your cash in the bank, there's no cash withdrawal to correspond to you paying cash for that breast but augmentation. But I wouldn't take, I'm not going to deposit money that I'm going to use already. I already saved up that money. For okay, my so you would save the money separately not deposit it well i knew pay yeah because i already had my uh, oh, my consultation in the beginning of that year of the beginning of 2014 so i was already saving up okay so well, that I when i get them go ahead you were saving up for the breast augmentation yeah but I you needed charlie adelson to put you on the payroll so that you could get insurance for your kids so, i was saving because i've always wanted my breast augmentation okay and the insurance for my kids is because my son had a disability, so I had to do a bunch of therapies for my son. Okay. And you heard... Oh, she knows how terrible that looks to the jury, that she went and got a breast augmentation before she paid for insurance for her kids. Ooh, that looks bad. She knows it. And then she comes back talking about her son's disability vying for sympathy from the jury. Ouch. I mean, these are the kind of moments that for me, at least as a trial watcher, I just find fascinating because you're watching with a little distance, real human dr drama. And the stakes are so heightened because we're talking about a murder trial uh, and of someone really extraordinary. And to have this like, I have this woman who was offered twice total immunity to just tell everything, to defiantly go up, to sort of buy her own ticket to the Titanic when common sense would say, was would be screaming, anyone with common sense would be screaming, don't go, don't go. And she's like insisting and her lawyers are all, not all, it looks like DeCoste wasn't on board, her lawyers on board pushing her forward because they're getting paid. It's crazy. I heard that Wendy Adelson testified that she's never known her brother to give any gifts to any ex girlfriends. Did you hear that? No, I don't recall that. Okay. Well, what makes you so special that Charlie Adelson wanted to give you all these things after the end of your relationship? All these things, like you make it seem like like he's giving me all of this stuff. Yeah. Out of the blue. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Katie. And so now Katie has to look like a limousine, breast dog, or, well, now she's not admitting to the breast augmentation. Limousine. Oh, no, she said she paid for the limousine. What was it? Oh, boy. Whatever the 500 things she admitted to that he gave her. The trip, et cetera, et cetera, all nothing. 
and they don't mean anything to her and that she can find another man to give her all these things. Like she's some femme fatale on the stand with the glasses, which is so interesting. So many of these defendants in murder trials, when they get up on the stand, they're wearing glasses. Remember Jody Arias comes to mind. So it's like they want to ugly them up for the jury and make them look studious, I guess. I don't know what it's about more trustworthy, like they're, I don't know, like they read books and that they've weakened their eyesight. I have no idea, but so many of them do it. Let me know why you think they do it. I do make it seem like that. Why is he giving you all this stuff? I don't know. Why did he put you on the payroll? Is that as a favor? Yes, ma'am. Not as payment for a murder? No, ma'am. Not to keep you happy? Why wouldn't he just pay me the cash? Why would I have to get a check from somewhere? I'm going to ask the questions, okay? Yes, ma'am. All right. So he put you on the payroll two months after the homicide, yes? Two months after the homicide. I so it looks like she just shot her lawyer a look like, can you believe I'm dealing with this? Do you see what? Do you guys catch that? When, when Georgia said, I'm, I'm asking the questions, watch this. Why would I have to get a check from somewhere? I'm going to ask the questions, okay? Yes, ma'am. All right. So he put you on the payroll two months after the homicide, yes? Two months after the homicide, mm -hmm. I will start in. She's like, I'm regretting that. It may have not been to her lawyer. It may just been to herself aside. Like, I can't even look at what's in front of me. Just get me through this. This is awful. This public humiliation. But I thought that was to her lawyer. That's where her lawyer is sitting. That's the direction. Yes, ma'am. All right. And were you involved in a sexual relationship with Mr. Adelson at that time? I'm not, I'm not 100% sure, like at the time frame. I believe so. Okay, so you were still sleeping with him after the homicide. See, Charlie Adelson had all this memorized. Katie's like really confused. She doesn't know what the story she's supposed to say up there. Oh, God, this must have been excruciating to be Katie and go through this. Not that I'm feeling sorry for her. She made her bed, but boy. I believe so. And was there an actual job opening at the Adelson Institute that you filled with this position? No, ma'am. All right, so it's a position that he created for you. Yes, ma'am. All right, and you heard testimony from the employees that work there that they've never heard of anybody working remotely before in the history of that office. Why, why did Mr. Adelson create a position for you well, he a I asked him for a favor if he can do that. Okay. What job description did you have when you worked for Mr. Adelson? I said I was just his like personal assistant. I wasn't going to the office okay. for that. Why did you on the wire talk about going to the office on the weekends because he did want me to go to the in the office to clean up a bit but i never i never did it wasn't it a joke between you and mr adelson about this job that you were performing for him i guess you didn't do anything on the laptop in reference to his work on the laptop yes ma'am like sign in into the into the Dentrix? Yeah. I believe I've done it before. How yes. many times did you do that? I don't recall. And what type of work did you do when you logged into Dentrix? Well, I was just looking at the patients, um, like the scheduling. Okay, and did you schedule any patients? No, I didn't schedule anything. Are there any patients would... we could call that could verify that they've ever had any contact with you? Not that I can recall, no. Oi. You know what this is like? This is like one of those dreams you have where you're in a play and you don't know your lines or you're, you've gone back to high school 
and there's a test and you haven't studied for it. That's exactly what this cross is like for me. That's what I'm witnessing. Someone who doesn't know the answers and is totally put up at the last minute on, on the stand. That's what it feels like. Unprepared. It's an unprepared nightmare. Did you ever go to the office on the weekends for any purpose? I believe I have, like probably, but not often, like once or twice. Only. Okay. And what was the purpose of that? He Visit. wanted me to clean up in the in the office. Oh, I probably out? just I probably just stopped that by at the office. Don't quite recall what I did. It's been a couple of years. All right. But I have stopped at the office before. Okay. Let's weekend. talk about um, the nightclub employment that yes, you ma'am. talked about. You testified that you were in fact employed at a nightclub around the time of the homicide. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. All right. And you said that you make up to fifteen hundred dollars a night at the nightclub. At a good day. I'm All a right. good night. And what at what nightclub was that? That was at Fate. All right. And Fate's the place that wrote you the checks that bounced? Yes, ma'am. And on those checks that bounced, the amount was I can't remember exactly, but maybe twelve hundred or seventeen hundred dollars for a month, right? Yes, ma'am. And that was tips for a whole month. No, it's the reason why they gave us those checks and the reason why it bounced, because a lot of us girls were complaining about it's supposed to be the way that like the owner or the, the whatever accountant guy that did it, he wanted to do just a percentage. So if like they swipe their card, it's a percentage of that is supposed to be our tips. Anything that's cash that the that the patrons you know pay for is like go straight to our pocket. Okay. So it's that so that it was, was for like card a credit tips. card, yeah, like a credit card percentage. All right. And so your credit card tips for the month were whatever that amount was. Yes, that was ma'am. On that check. All right. And that's what bounced. Yes, ma'am. Twice. Right. I and believe. did you quit Club Fate because of the bouncing checks? Yes, ma'am. And they were withholding some of our like money. All right. How many times? In your career as a bottle girl, did you make fifteen hundred dollars in one night? How many times? Yeah, I can't recall. More than five. Yes. More than ten. I can't. I can't give you like a specific number. Would you agree with Miss Mascara's testimony that an average night at the clubs was one hundred to two hundred dollars? That's not what. Overruled. Would you agree with that? No, ma'am. Would you agree with Ms. Mascaro's testimony that a good night at the club was four hundred to five hundred dollars a night? A good night? Uh, that's a good night to her. Okay. But she was working night. in Hollywood Live with me. Fate was a higher higher scale club. Okay. And and she didn't have my magical breasts, Georgia. Clearly, those brought in big big tips. I was also doing bartending as well. She wasn't bartending at those places. All right. And did the club that Ms. Mascara worked at, the lower end club, did the checks bounce there as well? No, we never received checks in, in that club. And do you have any documentation to show that you were, you know, like schedules or something like that to show your schedule around the time of the homicide at these clubs? Objection for Oh. I mean, I should have had it in my Texas. Like sometimes like they give us a schedule or they'll call us and tell us, okay, can you come in this and this day? Or we would be for that weekend, we would already know more or less what days to come in. Okay. And who was your boss at that time? I can't even remember his name because he got fired. All right. Is he here? Is he in Tallahassee for this trial? No. What about any girls that you worked with? Anybody like that? I don't that remember here? their names, no. This was years customers. Ago. No. Yeah, there's isn't it interesting? There's no one at, who can show up as a witness and say that you were making all this money. Isn't that interesting? Once again. And she's sitting there with private lawyers. Ah, oh, I would just love to know what was told to that judge. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's not some crazy funneling of money by the Adelsons. Maybe there's someone who saw the story and wanted to help her and Sigfredo Garcia out. But I can't see. 
I can't see that happening on planet Earth. I mean, it's like a one in a what? One in a 3,000 shot? Maybe 5,000? Would you agree, Ms. McVanwell, that you deposited $13,000 in cash in August of 2014? If that's what my bank records show. Okay. And that's the month after the murder, right? I believe so. Okay. You can't make that much at the club, can you? The $13,000? Yeah. Unless I've saved up and then I just deposited it that month. Okay. Is that what happened? But that all my income wasn't specifically from there. It was, there's times that I've gotten money from Secreto. All right. Well, is it a coincidence? With my Vanilla, that when you notice the striking spike in your income that happens exactly at the time of this homicide, don't you? I mean, it's there, isn't it? Well, in your diagram, yes. Yeah, but I mean, do you have a reason to dispute this diagram? It it's just, based on your cash deposits, isn't it? I guess so. All right. And so you would agree that there is a pretty striking amount of money that came in that you came into immediately after this homicide. From your diagram, I could see that, but I don't recall that. When did Secreto Garcia find out that? All right, I'm gonna take a quick break. I need a little break from all these scenarios, all these possible scenarios of Katie's. When I get back, going through your comments and more of Katie McBanawa's scenarios up on the stand when we return. If you are enjoying this episode of my true crime report, please hit the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel and share this episode. Get access to exclusive podcasts and other bonus content by becoming a patron today. If you have a question or comment for me, shoot me a super chat and I'll do my best to answer it and read it on air. Thanks so much. Now back to the show. Last time we were talking about this case, we were talking about Charlie Adelson. And this has to be right after his arrest. I'd never seen this picture before. And the hand is, I think that's my, my screenshot, but you just get an idea, always in the scrubs, always using his doctor title, even using it, saying he was a emergency room doctor to get out of a traffic ticket. That's what he bragged to his mother, said to his mother, I said, oh, I was a emergency room doctor. So Bunyay Sengayo says, Charlie really only loves two things, Charlie, Charlie's money, the women and other people in general were all playthings. Very true. And it's really sad because so much of this case is about rich people using poor people and that's what we're watching on the stand. Uh, Katie, I mean, obviously she had a choice. She made a bad choice. But the money, you know, money corrupts terribly. Water Color Mama 2345 says, question, when did you first ask Katie out? So this is, we're talking about Charlie Adelson's testimony. His answer was, well, I thought, she, uh, why did you first ask Katie out? Excuse me. Answer, well, I thought she was a really good listener. Number one requirement with Dr. Drivel. <laughs> Very funny. Kim, uh, uh, Kim Ashburn, 7945 says, more of Charlie's delusions. I don't believe... Dan told him he scored a 95 out of 100. I don't believe Dan said he thought the trial was going better than he expected. All Charlie BS. And him hearing what he wants to hear 
and very cocky to give away his food and clothes before the verdict. He was just so sure he was going home, but then said, oh, I knew I wouldn't get a fair trial here. He makes me dizzy. Great point. Total contradiction. You give away your food. You say, is this the van I'm going home in when you're being transported to the jail? I mean, to the, I'm sorry, excuse me, to the court, from the jail to the court. And then after it's all over, he's saying, oh, of course, I couldn't get a fair trial. I knew it was going to go badly. I knew from the jury. Yakira Arias says, I love listening to those beautiful letters from Dan's friends. I feel like the juxtaposition of him and the Adelsons is such a dichotomy. I think they hated him because he represented all the goodness they could never be. Very insightful, Yakira. And I have another one of the victim impact letters, and it's got a twist that I'll read at the end of this episode. So stay tuned for that. It's a really fun one and has a twist ending you won't expect. So back to Katie and her magical breasts and her scenarios. Charlie Adelson was involved in this conspiracy. When did he find out? Yeah. I believe when he got arrested. What about when you came home after meeting with Charlie Adelson at Dolce Vita? Did you tell Mr. Garcia that you'd met with Mr. Adelson? I don't I see. I don't know about the time frame again. I don't know if when I came home, I said that I spoke to Charlie. Would you agree in the calls and texts that follow that meeting with Mr. Adelson? Mr. Garcia is really angry with you. Yes. Yes. Okay. And he said in that text that we look, listened to recently or somebody read from the stand, whatever is going on with you and your homie is your business. You guys work that shit out. Don't text me. Who's your homie in that sentence? I believe he was referring to Charlie. Right. And he was angry to find out that Charlie was involved, wasn't he? I believe so, yes. Charlie told you he wanted this problem flushed. You were asked about that call on direct. Yes, ma'am. And was the problem the gang member who was threatening to extort his mother? I, I know he was just joking about that on that phone call, but I think it's because I used the restroom and then he referred to it as the problem flushing and because he was really talking to Yindra on the phone first. Right, and I got the whole reference to the bathroom humor, but the problem that he's referring to that he wants flushed is this guy that's extorting his mother, right? I believe so. Right. And flushed means he wants the problem resolved. I would assume. And you're the one to do it. I guess. Is Mr. Garcia familiar with handguns? Is he familiar with Objection, handguns? Objection, Judge. The world. Yes, ma'am. I guess so. Have you seen the ATM images yes, that are in evidence in this case? Yes, ma'am. All right. Is that Mr. Rivera and Mr. Garcia? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Garcia dumped his phone right after this murder, didn't he? Shortly after. I guess so. I mean, you were blowing him up and couldn't get him because his phone was off, right? I believe so. Do you have <clears throat> WhatsApp, or I should ask, back in 2014, did you have WhatsApp on your phone? I think so. Right. And what is WhatsApp? Uh, it's just another. That's very telling. So Wendy had it. Katie had it. Charlie had it. I, I, you would think, and I would think it would be something that he asked her to put on her phone. So they're all communicating in a way that's harder to trace. They're like instant message. All right. Did you hear the testimony about Wendy Adelson having visited the crime scene? Yes, ma'am. And did Ms. Adelson communicate with you through WhatsApp or any other type of communication no, the day of the murder? No, ma'am. Did Charlie Adelson let you know in any 
WhatsApp or any other kind of way that Mr. Markell had been shot on the day of the murder. Did you? What do you think? She looks a little terrified when she's asked about Wendy. What do you guys think? Is that just me knowing too much and seeing what I want to say? Let me look again. Through WhatsApp or any other type of communication no, the day of the murder. No, Did Charlie Aelson let you know in any WhatsApp or any other kind of way that Mr. Markell had been shot on the day no. of the murder? Did you tell Yendra Mascara that Mr. Markell had been in a car accident? I said an accident. I'm not 100% sure if I said car accident. Do you have any reason to question her memory that you said car accident? No. Did you talk to Luis Rivera on the day of the money drop? Did I talk to him? He, mm -hmm. I believe he called me. Okay. Yeah, he called my phone. And so is that a coincidence that the one time, and that's the one time you've ever spoken to Mr. Rivera on the phone, right? From all the records that we have in this case. Do you agree with that? I don't know if I've spoken to him at any other time. No, not that I can recall. Okay. And when did you find out? This is a brutal, brutal cross-examination by Georgia Kappelman. Fantastic job. I just can't believe anybody was like, mm, not so sure after this. But apparently it was one juror. Hmm that Dan Markell had been murdered. I found out when he got arrested, when Secreto got arrested. All right, so your lawyer asked you, um, would, would, can't remember exactly what she asked you, but the gist of it was, wouldn't you dump your phone if you'd been involved in criminal activity? Yes, ma'am. And isn't it true that you did in fact drop your phone not the day that you found that you're saying you found out Dan Markell was killed, but the day that law enforcement went up to see Mr. Garcia at Rapid Capital. That I no, I still had the same phone. Okay, but you weren't using it; it was turned off, right? No, I was still using my you phone. You didn't go to Walmart and purchase a burner phone. I Secreto purchased that. Yeah, but you went with him, didn't you? At that day, yes, I believe so. Okay. And you both got new phones that day. Yes. And that was the same day that law enforcement came to your residence and went to Rapid Capital, same day, same time. I think that was the following day. The following day is the day you got arrested, right? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Okay, so it was the day that law enforcement came to your residence. Yes, ma'am. Whoa, 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 whoa. Not a good fact there, Katie. So when law enforcement came to your residence, you got sick Fredo and said, let's go to Walmart and get new phones. Crazy. She's like, yes, yeah, that was the next day. Wouldn't it be much better if it were the next day? It just mean you're a little bit slow on getting it done. Terrible. Terrible. All this testimony makes her look terrible. Who is this one juror? But then again, there are trials where people get OJ, anyone? Someone told me to stop mentioning OJ, but it's just like one of those unbelievable verdicts. Isn't it true that you've been offered some kind of big payoff if you refuse to cooperate against Charlie Adelson? If I refuse? Yes, ma'am. No. Has anybody offered you some money? No. Do you remember telling anybody that you would be able to stay home after you get acquitted and have a tutor for your kids to be homeschooled at the house? No. Never made that comment. Did you ever show your breasts to some people and tell them that you got them courtesy of the professor? Definitely never happened. Courtesy of the professor. How dark is that? How dark is that? Here's my blood money breasts. Oh. Oh. So Reba Lee is saying mentor lawyer interviewed the holdout juror. She did not follow the judge's instruction of law. She got a few others to side with her. Idiot. <laughs> Sorry, but I don't, don't buy any bridges, lady. That's what I'd say. Where is she living? What planet is she living on? Even if you're not following law, like 
who finds this convincing? Who doesn't find this devastating for Katie? But then again, I told you about my bestie friend, my bestie girlfriend who lives a couple blocks away from me. And she's like, Mrs. No Nonsense. And she was on a jury. I can't even believe she got on a jury because she's so no she's so strongly opinionated. And they got they all acquitted this guy who was the middle man in a in a substance ring. And they said because he they they didn't they couldn't prove he knew what he was transporting. I was like, wow, that doesn't <laughs> That doesn't work on Locked Up Abroad, but it sure works in New York. Did you ask somebody if she thought God would forgive you for the role you had in this case? No. You indicated, and we saw the picture of you after your breast enhancement, and the testimony was that your tips, with a P, increased after breast surgery, right? Yes, ma'am. Yes, okay. And if you look on this chart of your cash deposit, the breast surgery occurred in October of 2014, right? Yes, ma'am. So, here? Yes, ma'am. You seem confused about when exactly your relationship with Mr. Adelson ended. I thought on direct you indicated that it that he faded into the background around the time that Mr. Markell was killed. Is that your testimony or not? It I mean, I guess I didn't realize it until now, like the whole him as Ms. Coas was saying about the ghosting me. I didn't realize that until now. Like, mm -hmm. But does that sound that like the was. right time frame that that occurred? I believe so. All right. And you talked about the media attention on this case and how the media reports, basically you were able to read those after Mr. Garcia's arrest. Is yes, that right? But the media reports were present before his arrest as well, right? Not, I wasn't aware of any media reports be before Secreto was arrested. Yeah. No. Even around the time of his homicide, it was there was reports coming out that indicated that there may be some connection to the South mm -hmm. Florida. I wasn't aware of it. Okay. And you asked if you knew you were being recorded on the wire, and your answer was no, right? Yes. Okay. And you were asked if you... Um, I guess, would have changed the way you spoke on the, some of those calls if you had known you were being recorded. Is that an accurate changed. summation of your testimony? I wouldn't have used the phone at all. Okay, but you're particularly embarrassed about your language on one of those calls, right? Yes, ma'am. I understood your testimony to be you would not have spoken that way if you'd known you were being recorded. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I wouldn't have made any of those calls because they were so incriminating. I wouldn't have talked on the phone at all. I would have done it mafia style. I mean, what kind of admission is that? But an honest one, there, a little, a little moment of honesty from Katie McBanoa. When did you learn you were being recorded? I honestly didn't think I was ever being recorded. Okay, so you didn't learn that the same day that you dumped the phones? I never dumped the phone. I okay, still had my my phone. Stopped using one phone and then you went up on another phone. I right. never stopped using that phone. I still had my other phone. Okay, well, I'm not disputing that you still had it, uh -huh. but there were no more calls after the day that the intervention at Rapid Capital, the interview of Mr. Garcia and the attempted I, interview of you occurred. I was still using my phone, the iPhone I've always had since... I, I still kept using that phone. Okay. The other phone that Sigfredo had bought, we were talking on that because obviously law enforcement came to go see him. So he felt like he had to use another phone to speak to me. Okay. But your, your testimony is you were still using the iPhone same as always with the exception of your communication with Mr. Garcia. Yes.
she just cares so much about privacy. She's totally innocent, so they have to all get new phones. I want to ask you about the call. It's labeled PP, Paul Paul. Yes, ma'am. You told Charlie Adelson that you left a really nasty message on the, the bump person's phone number. Do you remember that? And you went into detail about what the message was. I believe, I believe so, yes. Okay, and that was a lie, wasn't it? That I left a nasty message? Yeah. I believe Secreto was the one who left a, a nasty message. I might have just said that I did it. Okay. But it would have been a lie if you said that you did it because it wasn't you. Yes, ma'am. And in fact, Mr. Garcia didn't do it either, did he? Um, to my acknowledgement, I don't think so. Right. But he told you he did. Yes, ma'am. So he's lying to you. Yes? Yes, ma'am. You're lying to Charlie. Yes, Right? Why were you talking in code on the wire? Well, it's because I said that I'm either working, I'm at work, or I'm around my kids. Okay, and what does the code mean? What's it code for? What is the code for what? Why do you need a code? I code mean, because he's talking there's... about somebody, you know, that specific number, mm -hmm. and then he was talking about, um, you know, like trying to find out who is trying to contact his mom or trying to extort money from his mom. So every time that I would speak to him, I would just talk to if if like Yindra is next to me, I'm not gonna tell him like, oh, oh, remember what we were talking about or whatever. And my conversation wasn't gonna be like that around other people. All right. So for example, when you spoke to Mr. Garcia, you told him that Ethan's clothes would cost sixty-five dollars and seventy cents. Do you remember that? Yes, ma'am. And sixty-five seventy was the last four digits of that phone number, right? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. And so was this an example of the type of code that you used? I guess. And is are you telling the story that that was needed to protect your children or your coworkers in some way? Well, yeah, because I'm not disclosing any numbers around anybody else. Okay. Not saying a phone number out loud. One moment, please, John. Bye. Now we have a little bit of the dry mouth coming in. Okay, so that is Katie McManawa's amazing cross-examination. I just cannot believe anyone <laughs> thought that that was a good performance. And they were like, I don't know. Maybe, maybe she really wasn't involved. She's talking about getting burner phones. Charlie Adelson's giving her limo or vacations, cash, fixing your car, teeth whitening. I know she denied some of those things, but I don't care where you are. Bottle service bottle service. Remember that was the thing? Is that still a thing? It was the bottle service. So right before I go, I just want to share this victim impact statement with you. This is from Adam L. Berger and Stephen Frank. Judge Hankinson, in Jewish tradition, there is a legend that someone who successfully matches three people with their future spouses earns a place in heaven. There are various explanations for this story. One is that God matched Adam with Eve so that the beginning, I'm sorry, so that bringing spouses together is doing God's work. In a life cut far too short, Dan Markell made two successful matches. We are one of them. We each met Dan in the first few days of college. Adam lived two flights below Dan in his freshman dorm. Steve met Dan through his own freshman roommate. For each of us, our first conversations with him stand out. 
in our memory. He wanted to know everything about us, where we grew up, how many siblings we had, what their names were, what our interests were, what we wanted to do with our lives. In the space of a few hours, it seemed as though he knew everything about us. He remembered all of it. We each built strong, independent friendships with Dan, but he didn't actually introduce us until near the end of that first year in college. It certainly wasn't with the goal of making a match. This was early 1990s. Both of us were deeply in the closet, and the notion that we could be a couple was the furthest thing from our minds. But somehow Dan, but Dan somehow, excuse me, sensed that we would be great friends, and it was with that in mind that he brought us together. Over the next couple of years, the three of us became an inseparable group. Senior year, we all lived together and we remained in close touch after graduation. Even as Dan went off to Israel and then England on postgraduate fellowships, Steve went to study in Germany and Adam moved back to New York City. It was in that year, 1996, that the two of us finally became a couple. We have been together ever since. We remember the joy on Dan's face when we shared our news. We were, of course, nervous about telling him how would he react to the fact that two of his closest friends were gay and dating each other. But for Dan, the fact that we had found happiness was all that mattered, and he thought it was hilarious. He had quite literally matched Adam and Steve. At our wedding in 2006, Dan danced and celebrated with unbridled enthusiasm. He was part of the small crew who lifted our chairs and held them al aloft as we celebrated another Jewish tradition. On the video, which we have watched again and again in the years since his death, you can see his happiness. This is how we will remember him. Over the next few years, with our lives centered in New York and his in Tallahassee, we saw less of Dan. Still, our friendship endured as we each welcomed children into our lives. One of our last visits with Dan was in Cambridge in May 2013. We had just moved here to take new jobs, and Dan's visit coincided with our oldest son's fourth birthday party, which meant we didn't have much time to spend with him. But he joined the party, mingling with the other preschool parents and having a great time, even though he didn't know anybody and the occasion was marked by sing-alongs and cupcakes rather than grown-up conversation. Dan took so much pride in the fact that we had children because for him, children were life's greatest gift. Dan's love for his two boys were obvious and overwhelming. It defined him. They were the central focus of his life, one of the greatest tragedies of Dan's death, is that those boys are now being raised by the very people who conspired to have him murdered and who are working every day to erase his memory from their lives. We hope they do not succeed. We have always imagined we would have Dan with us over the decades, challenging us and cheering us as we move through the stages of our lives. We expected more visits, more meals, more stories. We looked forward to telling our kids how Dan brought us together and telling Dan's kids silly stories and about his college hijinks. We looked forward to one day comparing notes with Dan as our children started college and formed adult friendships of their own and perhaps attended the weddings of each other's children. 
None of this will come to pass, nor did Dan ever have the chance to make his third match, though we have little doubt he would have. But as abbreviated as Dan's life was, we know that God saw the light in his beautiful soul and how hard Dan worked to repair our broken world. We know that Dan earned his place in heaven. Dan's academic study was justice, a topic that was the, at the core of his being. Writing about justice fused his passion for Jewish study, his instinctive sense of right and wrong, and his love of argument and debate, as well as his delight in taking provocative stands. It saddens us beyond measure that the subject, subject excuse me, to which Dan devoted his academic life now hangs over his death like an inescapable shadow. Will there be justice in our lifetime for Dan? Will there be appropriate punishment for the people responsible for taking the life of our friend? Will there be some consequence that deters others from committing such heinous crimes? We ask your honor to do everything in your power to answer those questions with a definitive yes. Sincerely, Adam L. Berger, Stephen E. Frank. Okay, that's what I have for today. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, says, for the super chat, I always look forward to watching your streams, Roberta. When you're not on, it's murder. Is it murder, Stephen? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much. That's kind of you to say. That is what I have for today. Thanks so much for listening, guys. I will be back Wednesday with another episode. Too bad no Donna hearing, but I'm sure that the next hearing, whenever it is, will be exciting and good. Have a great night, everybody. See you Wednesday.